Julie Terrio is only 25, but she's already regarded as one of the most talented cell biologists in the United States. At school, she wanted to be a crime writer, an actress or an architect, but instead she found her way into biology via theoretical physics. Dr. Terrio lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts with her boyfriend Kevin and a pet chinchilla. Among her seven wonders of the world are bower birds, slime moulds, gene therapy and the end of the universe. Well, I think the, the thing that makes people interested in science, or at least the thing that makes me interested in science, is uh, still the same sort of instinct that makes kids want to take clocks apart just to see how they work. And what I'm doing now, and getting paid for, although not extremely well, is basically to take cells apart and see how they work. And it's just everything that scientists do is just driven by curiosity and driven by the human desire to understand what's going on around us. Most animals will go to extraordinarily great lengths to attract mates. Humans do. But of all animals, I think probably birds go to the most extreme lengths to become attractive to the opposite sex. The tail of a peacock seems like a horrible thing to have to drag around. But the birds have evolved this tail simply for the purpose of being attractive to the opposite sex. The specific example I'm going to talk about is bower birds, which are small, fairly drab-looking birds common in Australia and New Guinea that do a very extraordinary thing. The males, when they're getting ready to mate, take large sticks and dig them into the ground and then weave twigs in between the sticks. Different species of bower birds make different shaped bowers and they'll decorate them with flowers and with fruits and with butterfly wings and colorful fungi and basically anything they come across in the forest. And what's amusing about this particularly is that these bowers have absolutely no function. They're not nests. After the, after the birds mate, the females go off and they have nothing more to do with each other. The female builds a nest and raises the young all by herself. The males build these things only to be beautiful. And the females choose which male to mate with only on the basis of whether or not the bowers are beautiful. The idea of beauty then in the decoration of the bowers, you could imagine either as something that the birds are just born with, that evolution has somehow taken care of this and all of the birds know what's a pretty bower, all of the males know what to build, all of the females know what to pick. But that actually doesn't appear to be the case. It looks much more like these birds have developed a sort of aesthetic culture. If you look at the same species of bower birds in different locations, the types of decorations that they use will vary a great deal. Some males will choose a particular color snail shell, for example, and make huge piles of that color snail shell. And other males that live only a few meters away will totally ignore the snail shells and concentrate on flowers. The thing that really strikes me about this as being so wonderful is that it's such a, a remarkably human thing to do. And we tend to, to prize things that seem to make us as humans different from other animals. And some of the things that we particularly prize are things like our ability to make tools, our ability to use language, our ability to be creative, and our ability to recognize beauty without function. And as we learn more about complicated behaviors of different animals, it seems more and more like none of those things are unique to humans. And there's nothing that we can do, even to the extent of making objects of art and appreciating objects of art, that some other animal can't also do. I didn't always want to be a scientist. In junior high school, I wanted to be a writer. And then I went through quite a long period, actually, where I wanted to be an architect. When I went to college, I was quite determined to major in physics, and I wanted to be a physicist just like my father. Sort of accidentally, I also started taking biology classes. And 
as soon as I started taking high-level biology classes, I knew that I had found where I was supposed to be. I discovered what it felt like my mind was built to do and was built to understand. And I could put things into the proper contexts. It was almost as if um, my mind was one of those big desks full of pigeonholes. And every time I learned a fact in biology, I would be able to slide it into a pigeonhole that already existed for it. My next wonder is a remarkable organism, a very common soil organism called Dictyostelium discoidium. Most creatures on Earth, plants as well as animals, can be divided fairly easily into two classes. They're either unicellular organisms or multicellular organisms. In a unicellular organism, there's only one cell, and that cell alone performs all the functions that the organism needs to do to be able to survive. Um, many times it can move as an individual cell, it can eat, it can reproduce. Multicellular organisms, like you and me, consist of basically a pile of cells which have all gone into different specialties. And they cooperate with each other so that each individual cell only needs to be very good at doing the one thing that it knows how to do and will let other cells in the body do perform all of these other functions that are necessary for life. However, there are a small number of organisms which can't quite decide whether they would rather be unicellular or multicellular. And one example of these strange organisms is Dictyostelium. The organism goes through most of its life living in the soil and forests as a unicellular beast. And it crawls around and eats and divides, single cells divide to form two daughters, um, living quite happily as a unicellular organism. However, when there's not enough food around or when there's not enough moisture around, they begin to send off chemical signals to each other. All the amoebae will start crawling towards each other and pile up. They um, form a cylindrical slug, which looks for all the world like a little maggot, and start crawling around as, a, as an organism. It leaves a trail of slime behind it, and this is why these types of organisms are called slime molds. This slug crawls around for a while, and then when it finds a place that it likes, it stops, and it undergoes a really remarkable um, process of differentiation and development. And the head grows up and starts forming a stalk. And then all the rest of the cells start to crawl up that stalk. These cells that have ended up at the top then undergo another process of differentiation where they become spores that are extremely sturdy and can withstand long periods of starvation, long periods of drought, and then just hang around and wait and do nothing in a totally inert form until they are presented with an environment where they again have enough water and enough food. And then the spores crack open and a new amoeba crawls out. So this is a scanning electron micrograph of a spore, which is this um, ovoid object here, that is just split open and the new amoeba is crawling out. Now this amoeba will go spend its life in the soil of the forest, crawling around and eating and uh, dividing to form more dictostelium until, again, starvation occurs and they have to come back together and cooperate as a multicellular organism in order to survive. What we're trying to do as scientists is to confront mysteries, things that we don't understand at all, and try to make little excursions into this great field of unknown. It's difficult both to cut tracks into the unknown and to um, bring the knowledge that you've gained from cutting those tracks back in to fit in with everything else. And you have no guarantees that you'll be able to do either. 
My studies involve behaviors of single cells, and what I actually look at is the way that cells move and the signals they send to each other and the signals they receive from external cues to tell them where to go when they move through the body. The thing that's most striking about it is how large the unknown is. Certainly in the field that I'm in, where the unknown is enormous and the known is very small and very scattered. A new microscope being used by British scientists is enabling them to study the smallest particle of matter, the atom, more closely than ever before. But the scanning, tunnelling microscope does more than just look at objects, it can pick up and move about individual atoms, a capability which it's claimed has the potential to revolutionise the electronics industry. The way that this instrument works is it consists of a, uh, a very fine stylus, like a record player stylus that you drag um, under computer control across a surface that you want to look at. And the very close contacts between the stylus of the tip and the surface attract each other, and the atoms actually attract each other, using a couple of different kinds of forces, particularly electrostatic forces, normal charge interactions, and also a force called the van der Waals force, which is a, a very weak force that occurs between atoms that are very close together. So if you have a flat surface and you want to image something on it, you drag the stylus over the surface in a series of lines close to each other, and the computer can add them up. And by this technique, you can see individual atoms. The real marvel of it is simply the ability to see in a way that we've never been able to see before with any other type of instrument. This is a, a picture that was taken with a scanning tunneling microscope of DNA. And you can see here very clearly the lines of the double helix. And you can even see these little ladders across, which are the base pairs in the DNA stacked up in each other. This here is an atomic model drawn by a computer of what we thought the shape of DNA would be at exactly the same scale. And you can see this is really quite beautiful and quite amazing. Placing of individual atoms looks exactly like what we thought it was supposed to look like. You can use it not only to look at the location of individual atoms, but also to move the atoms. The first example of this uh, was published in Nature a couple of years ago. And a group of scientists from IBM took a flat nickel surface and then sprayed it with xenon atoms. Xenon is a gas that shows very nice individual atoms that are easily imaged using the scanning tunneling microscope. They then wanted to show the potential of using this instrument for dragging individual, individual atoms around. And the way that they decided to do that was to take the atoms on the nickel surface that they had sprayed out and drag them down to form letters. And since they were scientists from IBM, of course, they took the atoms and spelled out the letters IBM. So in this picture, every spot that you see is an individual xenon atom which has been laboriously dragged across the nickel surface to be in the exact position it needs to be to spell out these letters. Humans, if you cut off the tip of a finger, um, you can regenerate the tip of the finger. But if you cut off anywhere below the nail, there's too much scarring and the limb doesn't grow back. But with salamanders, you can actually cut off a whole leg right at the place where it joins the body, and the salamanders will grow a whole new leg. Obviously, this is something we should be quite jealous of that the salamanders can do. And if you think about it, what's surprising is not that salamanders can regrow new limbs, but rather that we can't. Because every human being, and every complex animal, starts off life as a single cell. And that single cell divides to form a mass of tissue. The cells in that tissue then differentiate to become all the cells of your body. And in a limb, they become the bones and the muscles and the skin and the nerves and everything else. Every cell in your body should have, theoretically, all the information necessary to make every other cell in your body, because the DNA in the nucleus of all these cells is identical. So it seems like if we lose an arm, 
the cells remaining in the area where the wound is made have all the DNA that originally programmed the growth of the arm. And there should be no reason um, from first principles why those cells couldn't just replicate and form a new arm. Well, the reason they don't is twofold. Um, the first problem is that in higher animals, scarring occurs when you lose an arm that prevents growth of new tissue. But the real problem is that after an embryo develops, when you go through this process of differentiation, the cells actually forget what they used to know. So adult cells no longer remember how to regenerate all of these tissues. And in salamanders and newts, the cells um, in the region near the wound go backwards in the developmental pathway and they'll proliferate and then start to differentiate to form bone tissue and muscle tissue and skin. And there are a lot of scientists now at work on understanding how this process of de-differentiation occurs. It would be wonderful, of course, if when somebody loses an arm in an accident, um, you could apply just some sort of growth factor to that area, to the wounded area, which would cause the cells to de-differentiate and then be able to grow a whole new arm. There is a lot of hostility to science for a lot of different reasons. Part of the hostility to science is this sort of emotional, basic mistrust of the way that science approaches the world. When some scientific discovery is made and it's published in the New York Times, people will read it and think, aha, this is the truth, this is the fact. And then a couple of years later, something else will come along. Now we know a little more about it and this is the new story. I think people feel quite rightly sort of betrayed by that sort of presentation um, that scientists must not really know what they're talking about because we keep changing our story. Well, really the whole point of science is to keep changing the story, is to keep adding things to it and increasing our understanding of it. And sometimes it'll change drastically and sometimes it'll change very subtly. People very rarely stop to think about how amazing they are, that this animal, through essentially through an act of will, can actually produce light. Fireflies actually aren't the only type of organism that can make light. There are uh, many different types of organisms from all different phylas that can do this trick. Way under the surface of the ocean, there are fish that make light. These types of fishes use light for hunting, for defense. If an animal comes up and tries to eat one of these fish, it can flash light at it and sort of scare it off. Or uh, some animals use the light in mating, and that's what fireflies do. Males fly around and emit light in various patterns. And the females, sitting on the plants, looking around, if they feel like mating, they'll then flash and the males will come over. So fireflies use their ability to produce light to mate. And some other types of animals use their ability to produce light to hunt. But some kinds of fireflies have actually evolved their use of the flashing and mating to also extend to hunting. And the way that they do this is by luring in fireflies of other species by mimicking their types of flashes. The females of a group of fireflies that's known as Futurus have become very good at this. What they do is they see a male of another species, preferably a smaller and weaker species, flying around, flashing out its signal, looking for females. The Futurus female sitting on the plant then flashes out at that male the appropriate response for its species. So it flies over and thinks it's going to find a receptive female of its own species who wants to mate, and is confronted instead with a hungry Futurus female, which eats it. It seems almost sort of miraculous that these enzymes have evolved to do this very particular thing. And uh, this ability to produce light is sort of a good example of the, the general biological precept that if anything is possible, some organism at one time or another will have done it.
This next one is not so much a wonder as an unsolved mystery, which everybody is eagerly waiting to have solved. And it involves the question of how the universe is going to end. And to introduce this, I want to read a little poem by Robert Frost called Fire and Ice. Some say the world will end in fire, and some in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. This poem was published in 1923, but the debate about how the universe is going to end is actually still exactly the same today. When the universe began, all of the matter and energy was compressed into a very small space, which then exploded in the Big Bang. And all of the matter in the universe is still flying apart from each other very rapidly as sort of the aftermath of this explosion. However, at the same time, all of the matter in the universe is attracting all of the other matter in the universe by gravity. And this gravity is sort of acting as a brake to slow down the expansion that's occurring after the Big Bang. Now, if there's relatively little matter in the universe, the gravity will never quite be able to overcome the shock of this explosion. And all the matter will just keep flying out forever and ever. And eventually, as it flies out, it'll get colder and colder, and the universe will end in ice. However, if there is enough matter in the universe, eventually the gravity, the gravitational forces, will put such a strong break on this expansion that they'll be able to overcome it. And then all the matter in the universe, instead of flying apart from each other, will be attracted towards each other gravitationally and come back to the center again. And then we'll have a big crunch in corollary to the Big Bang. If the big crunch happens, then everything will blow up again and the universe will end in fire. There's a parameter called the cosmological constant, which is basically a ratio of the amount of matter in the universe to the amount of matter that would be theoretically necessary to close the universe, to uh, make it end in a big crunch. And if this number is less than one, that means there's not enough matter and the universe will expand forever. If the number is greater than one, there's plenty of matter and the universe will eventually crunch. If the number is exactly one, then the universe will sort of coast to a halt. Everybody, well not everybody, but I think most people would probably prefer that the cosmological constant be greater than one and that the universe come back and crunch. It's very sort of satisfying to think that, that the existence of our universe is something that's more or less perpetual because every time it blows up it'll come back together again and the creation and destruction of universes will go on and on forever. There's no need for any beginning and there's no need for any end. There's a beginning and end to the particular universe that we live in, but another universe will be created from its ashes. The problem is that by looking at all the types of matter that we can measure in any way and adding them all up, the cosmological constant is much, much less than one. There's really no conceivable way that the, the amount of matter we can see can add up to be enough to close the universe. So we're left right now with the mystery of first whether the universe will end in fire or in ice and if the answer is really fire as is more sort of philosophically satisfying for many people where all that extra matter is and why we can't detect it. I right now am pretty much on the, on the track to stay in academic research, which I enjoy very much. Ultimately though, I would very much like to have some input in the shaping of science policy. Life is getting sufficiently complicated that people really need to be able to have a basic understanding of science and technology. I think there's a huge and to some extent very artificial gap between scientists and technologists and the general public, which is detrimental, I think, to, to most people's lives.
My last wonder of the world is a medical advance in the field of gene therapy. Good evening. Andrew Gorbea will not remember what happened this weekend, but he has made medical history. Little Andrew Gorbea was born without an immune system, the same condition that killed his sister. Doctors took blood cells from Andrew's umbilical cord, exposed them to a genetically altered virus, then injected those improved cells back into his blood system. His anxious parents waited in surgical masks and gowns. It is still not entirely certain the breakthrough procedure will work. Doctors here think they have taken a giant step to curing a very rare disease, but the technique opens the possibility of curing many more common genetic defects. John Gibson, NBC News, Los Angeles. The problem, of course, is that once we develop the technology to start monkeying around with people's DNA, to change the genes, not only in newborn babies, but also even in adults, we start running into a staggering array of ethical problems about what it is proper to use this sort of technology to fix. Whereas with adenosine deaminase deficiency, where it's a devastating disease that's almost entirely fatal, it would, you'd be very hard pressed to find a person who would argue that that's something that shouldn't be fixed. But with a lot of other genetic diseases or genetic variations among people, it's a matter of opinion and a matter of, a matter of ethical debate whether certain things ought to be fixed or not. For example, sometime in the distant future, when we understand what genes um, give people a certain height or give them normal eyesight, as opposed to, to myopia like I suffer from and many other people, um, is it really desirable, will it be desirable to try to fix those things when the only problem with them really, not that they're diseases, but just that they're inconveniences. Personally, it terrifies me for things like, for example, manic depression. Um, I don't really know if that's something that we should be monkeying around with. Manic depression is a devastating, life-threatening disease, and yet the list of, of extraordinary artists and extraordinary thinkers that have had manic depression is very long. And nobody really knows whether having the tendency towards manic depressive illness actually adds to a person's ability to, to think broadly or to think creatively. Certainly a lot of people would think that it does. However, people with manic depression also suffer a great deal. Is that something that we ought to be fixing? I don't think there's an easy answer to that, and I don't think there will ever be an easy answer to that. And having power, having the power to change things like that without having the proper ethical and moral basis to make those decisions on, I think is extremely dangerous. And I don't think there's any society in the world right now that has a sufficiently solid ethical or philosophical or moral basis to be able to make those decisions.